Hi, I'm here to talk about building little languages. So, first obvious question is, what is a little language? Well, it's not a big language like Rust. It's usually something small and simple for some specific problem where it is designed just to solve that problem really well. Hopefully not Turing complete, you know. Um, often used in other languages, um, often interpreted or somehow otherwise not compiled to machine code. You know, your configuration files, hopefully not Turing complete, hopefully not like send mail. Uh, CSS as another example, you know, relatively simple, often in combination with other languages. You know, your query languages, often little languages, though SQL gets pretty big. Uh, templating languages, and you know, there's kind of a spectrum between big and little. Um, so my particular little language that I built was motivated by this specific example of transit data. Uh, so in addition to being a Rust enthusiast, I'm a transit enthusiast and I like to know all sorts of obscure facts about the transit system in my hometown of Boston. Um, and fortunately, the transit agency in Boston publishes all sorts of data in open formats, including real-time locations for all the buses and trains, so you can see where everything is. Uh, and they publish this in protocol buffer format. You just download it from a URL, it gets updated every 30 seconds. And of course, I have a script set up on my little rented server out on the internets to go and download this data every 30 seconds and keep a giant archive so I can go back and see how things were working during the terrible snowstorm. Well, in theory, I still have to actually have some tools for dealing with this data. Uh, and part of the problem is that it's a lot of data. You can't just, you know, you can just stick it in a database, but it's like 200 megabytes a day. A year's worth starts to add up for my cheap rented server on the internet. So I just store it the cheap way, which is concatenated and exzipped. Compresses really well. But there's not really a good way to search through it. So I figure I'll just build my own little search tool. And the way to do that is to build a little query language that lets me find out, for example, where is bus 5001? Um, and protocol buffers, in case you don't know, they're like a binary format. They're, the data model is kind of like your JSON or whatever. It has structures, it has arrays, it has fields and messages. Um, and so there's other similar formats with other similar query language. XPath was kind of an inspiration in some way. And there's just, you know, a basic example of what it looks like. And so getting a little bit more into what is behind the language. There's sort of different parts that you have to go through. My language has a parser. Every language has to have a parser more or less which reads these expressions and then produces a parse tree. And then, because protocol buffers actually have a pretty well-defined schema and it tells you what type all the parts of the message are supposed to be and so on, there's actually a type checker. Very, very simple type checker, uh, but it's there nonetheless. And then the actual evaluator that actually takes that expression and runs it against my giant archive of a year's worth of bus data and spits out the little subset that talks about just that one bus that I'm interested in because it's the shiny new hydrogen fuel cell bus that we've been waiting for for a year and we want to know where it is. <laughs> so Parser, um, you heard in the previous talk about how there are these awesome tools for building parsers. I just built my own. Uh, it ended up not being that complicated. Uh, you know, you just take, it just reads through the string and either successfully matches it and returns some successful result and the remainder of the string that it didn't parse, or it, you know, fails to parse, it returns an error and then maybe you'll get a parse error. And the parser reads this expression, you know, the string that in the earlier slide returns a parse tree. And that gets fed into the next section, 
which is the type checker. So the parse tree is literally just like a struct tree of strings, more or less. Uh, and now we have to make sure that all the actual words in there, like the you know entity.vehicle that you saw earlier, that there are actual messages that are defined uh, for this. And so these definitions are in this description file that Google ships. And fortunately, Google ships a whole bunch of tools to deal with protocol buffers. Unfortunately, none of them are really designed with Rust in mind. Fortunately, there are tools that are designed with C in mind, and also fortunately, Rust is pretty good at talking to C. Um, so actually, what I ended up doing is using the C tools, they produce a C file from this description of what this transit data format is supposed to be like. That, I compile that into a, an SO, shared library, and then just load that from Rust and have a little FFI wrapper <laughs> around it that lets me use this C code generated by this Google tool directly from Rust. And that lets me get at, you know, what, you know, what are the valid field names? What are the data types for those things? Are the expressions that, th that were entered in that, you know, original thing that we're parsing, are they like valid? Um, and so the type checker does that and then returns a sort of more refined version of the tree to the next stage, which actually executes, sort of executes that. Um, and uh, this also has some other, um, also takes advantage of some other things that Rust is pretty good at. Um, which is the iterators, uh, which are a wonderful, wonderful feature, and make it, you know, make it very easy to sort of build build things on top of. Uh, and the way this evaluator works is basically, I built a little iter iterator type that will take some generic input, um, actually something that implements a specific type of trait, and then basically return successive protocol buff messengers, messages out of that. And then you just run, you know, run the sort of expression and see if it matches. And the code for that turns out to be surprisingly compact because of the powerful abstractions that Rust has. So this is the actual code for the actual evaluator. Um, constructs this iterator and then it just filters and see sees does this, you know, does this message uh, match the tag? Does it um, match the filter expression? Uh, and then if it is, well, call the callback. And if it, and if it doesn't, and we still have more sort of messages, uh, more expressions to check, then, you know, recur and go deeper and check if it continues to match. Uh, and this is actually, um, so the actual, uh, some of the backstory of this is that I actually originally started writing this in C. And I desperately wanted to write it in Rust, but unfortunately Rust didn't run, or the standard compiler didn't have a version for my computer, which is this lovely little ARM thing. And I started writing it in C. They actually released the ARM build an official ARM build of the compiler like two days after I did that. Um, and then I kept going with C regardless. I got very, very frustrated. The code got very big and confusing. Um, and then eventually I got so frustrated that I rewrote the whole thing in Rust and it ended up being much, much more compact. So I guess the things that I learned from all of that um, Rust is great for writing compilers. Not really surprising. I mean, the first really big program written in Rust was the Rust compiler. So that was sort of the guiding force behind a, a lot of the way the language was designed. And so it was designed pretty well for writing compilers. Um, you know, things like the data types, the 
the way the enums work, the way you have match statements. You know, that's basically what you need to write a compiler. Um, Rust's FFI makes it really easy to reuse C code. It would have been a lot harder to actually get all of these descriptions of like what the messages are supposed to be like and actually basically write my own compiler for that format as well and get all the data out of the sort of published standard or have to basically code it up by hand and it would only work for transit data. Um, but thanks to relatively easy FFI, I could just reuse all of that stuff and wrap it in nice safe interfaces and Rust is great for building composable abstractions. So the iterators um, were sort of very, very efficient and made it very easy to write this. Um, sort of going back, going back to the code, um, filter, the, the filter, you know, is a trait and you, know, you just write some write an implementation for it and you have some, you know, that's eval function that you can implement for different types of trait, of different types of filters, makes it very easy to write this particular code and then you don't have a giant like switch statement like you would if you were doing C. Um, so that makes it more compact and yeah, Rust is generally great. And I guess the conclusion is, little languages are really not that hard. You shouldn't be afraid if you see a problem where it's applicable to go and write your own. Uh, and you know, I would encourage you to do so. I feel like there's been this huge sort of <laughs> renaissance of new languages, big like Rust and little like all the other things that people do. So. I would encourage you to go and build your own. And you know, you can go look at my code up on the internets. And I guess I'm uh, a little bit out of ideas, but uh, if you guys have any questions? Anyone? Comments? Oh, wait, before you ask your question. I was informed that they did not show up on the recording last time. Hold on, here I come. Here you go. Um, after you had an initial, I'm assuming you, 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 you wanting to be able to see things, do things, you had an initial foundation that you, you know, expanded on, added features to after you had the general framework in place. Uh, during that expansion, were there any points in which uh, you wanted to do something that Rust wasn't giving you? Uh, very good question. So one of, I mean, there were, ultimately I managed to successfully battle Rust and get what I wanted. Um, but there were definitely moments of like difficulty and like battling with the borrow checker and sort of transitioning it from, oh, we'll parse this message out of a buffer to oh, let's build a streaming interface and I have all sorts of clever ideas for how to do that. And then sort of fighting the system and uh, fighting the borrow checker when it wouldn't let me do what I want and then having to take a two week break for various other reasons and then coming back and being like, oh, I'm missing a pair of curly braces. That completely solves all my problems. Um, so I'm kind of looking forward to uh, things like non-lexical lifetimes that will hopefully make these things a little bit easier. Anyone else? You all just really want to go to lunch. Yeah. <laughs>